This morning, we're going to introduce the Ten Commandments, and uh, you're probably, hopefully, familiar with the Ten Commandments, but uh, what I'd like to do is to start out in the chapter just before the Ten Commandments are given. This is Exodus chapter 19, and uh, we're going to do a two-part introduction, actually, part one today and part two next week, because uh, there's a lot in chapter 19 that we need to learn to sort of set the, the, the background and, and get the setting for when the Ten Commandments were issued. It, it's not like the children of Israel uh, just left Egypt and walked out, and then uh, they came to Mount Sinai, and, and all of a sudden they're like, hey, there's this tablet, and there's these ten rules on it. Just there's more to it, way more to it than that. And so um, we're going to look in Exodus 19, verses 1 through 8 today. And I'm going to use the screen up here a little bit this morning with the sermon and just put some verses up there in case that helps anybody um, with, uh, with, uh, with seeing and, and hearing the word this morning. So... In Exodus 19, verses 1 and 2, it says, In the third month, after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai, for they had departed from Rephidim and had come to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. So Israel camped there before the mountain. Now this, these two verses tell us that God had kept his word to Moses because back in chapter 3 of Exodus and verse 12, when God was calling Moses to lead his people out of Egypt, he said, you're going to bring them right here. This is the spot where Moses was called by God uh, to bring him to. This is the same mountain where God met and called Moses through the burning bush. And when we get to chapter 20, and the giving of the Ten Commandments. What's interesting there is that when the Ten Commandments are given, it's exactly 50 days after the Passover event. So the, the feast that was given to commemorate the giving of the law was the Feast of Pentecost, which means 50th, 50, 50 days after Passover, the law was given. And it just so happens, if you believe in happenstance, I don't, but if you want to say it that way, 50 days after Jesus' resurrection was the feast of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came and began to dwell with all the believers in the church. So uh, this is a fulfillment now of what God had told Moses when he called him. So now we come to the next section, three through six, and it says, and Moses went up to God and the Lord called him to him from the mountain saying, thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel, and I have put some emphasis here on some of these words, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians. If you're familiar with the story, you know, the plagues and all of the things and the, pass, and the, uh, the Passover, uh, firstborn killed unless the blood was applied, all of that. God is reminding Moses and ultimately Israel, you've seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. So God is saying, look, this was me. I did this. If not for me, Amen. this would not have happened. And so he says now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, if you, so he said, this is what I did. If you will do this, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people for all the earth is mine. And we're going to talk about that in a minute too. All the earth is mine, says the Lord. And he says, if you do this, 
You'll be a special treasure to me above all people. Well, that sounds, I don't know, unfair to the rest of the world. Well, God can do what he wants to. And verse six says, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So, as we read these words, there are a number of things that come to mind that I think we should consider. First of all, because God is God, he gets to set the parameters, the requirements, the standards, and the conditions for admission into his covenant family. He has every right to do that. He's God. And if someone wants to become a part of the people of God, they must abide by God's rules. It's not that hard. It's pretty simple. God's deliverance from slavery for, for Israel, God's deliverance from that slavery that they were in was not just liberation, but it was adoption. Their salvation, which included the liberation and adoption that occurred, was facilitated, inaugurated, and initiated by the Lord's action, intervention, and protection. So, what, what can we learn from this section of Scripture? God is God, and God can do what He wants, and He can call who He wants. But something else we see here is that Duty follows deliverance. Duty follows deliverance. Salvation is unto service. So when God saves us, he saves us from something and to something, and we're going to get into that. But God very clearly said, look what I did. He brought Israel out of Egypt. But here's the next thing that needs to happen. The next step is getting Egypt out of Israel. Getting the world thinking, the way of thinking, out of God's people. Because that's what they knew. For 400 plus years, they were slaves in Egypt. And they began to get used to and comfortable with the way of the Egyptians and the way they thought. And God was going to have to retrain them. He was going to have to uh, show them that you can't just live any way you want to and be my people. God's people must be different from the world. They must stand out. They must be different, particular, and unique. In fact, God uses the word special, a special treasure to me above all else. That's the way it's always been. God's people are different from everybody else. And this is to be seen clearly in both the walk and the talk of God's people. They're to come out from the world and be separate. They are to be kingdom citizens who serve the king of kings whose, and people whose citizenship is in heaven. They are a kingdom of priests who serve as ambassadors and reconcilers of God and man. They represent a king and a kingdom in the form of being a holy nation. So God's people stand out from all of the other nations because they're holy, they're consecrated, they are devoted and set apart by God for the purposes of God. And so God's people today similarly will stand out and be different by keeping the covenant that the Lord gives as it is revealed in Scripture. And for Israel, it was keeping the covenant as we would, as they're going to be told in chapter 20 when they're given the Ten Commandments. Those who truly belong to God are going to live like they do. Perfectly? No. Do any of y'all live a perfect life? I don't. I'm just raising my hand in case, you know, you didn't know what to do. 
but as a believer as a as a child of god as being a part of the people of god the trend of your life should be growth in godliness right the longer you're a christian the more christ like you should be you should still be a baby christian 10 years after you've been saved there should be growth Amen. so what happens to those who belong to god they they have a new life they have a new master they have new power the holy spirit comes to dwell within them they receive new instructions that this is how you're to live now and they have a new purpose so they are they are converted the bible talks about the old passing away all things becoming new they walk in the light and no longer in darkness once they were dead in trespasses and sins when they followed the ways of the world but god because of his great love made us alive with christ even when we were spiritually dead in order that he might show the riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in christ jesus the bible says for it is by grace that you've been saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of god not of works so that no one can boast Amen. so this was all of god your salvation is all of God. And what was true of the nation of Israel then is true of us who are God's people today. We are God's people because he saved us by grace, through faith, and not by our works. They didn't do anything to save themselves. They just obediently followed and obeyed God as he led them along. And when he saved us, he saved us, as I mentioned earlier, from something but he also saved us to something he saved us from sin from the wages of sin which is death the bible says he saved us from god's wrath which is coming upon all who choose to remain in their sin and live their own way rather than god's way and he saved us from ourselves i mean just look around at this messed up world Look at what people are doing to each other, to themselves. Look at the insanity, the assault on reality, the rebellion against creation and the creator and against what God defines as good and evil, right and wrong. Listen, God sent Jesus to save his people from their sins, not in them but he also saved us to something, not just from something, but he saved us to something because have you ever noticed that in most cases when a person is saved, they don't go straight to heaven as soon as they're saved? I mean, if we did, then that means none of us are saved here today. But as soon as a person is born again, they don't go straight to heaven usually. I mean, there might, might have been a few that did. But why don't we? Because we have work to do here. We are the Lord's ambassadors, the Bible says. We are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, be reconciled unto God. So we have a message to, to tell to the nations. We are his witnesses. So we're ambassadors, we're witnesses in fact, look at how Peter describes it in 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. He says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. You see, that's very familiar. It sounds just like what we read in Exodus 19 a while ago, almost. That's because God's people have been God's people throughout history. Whether they're called Israel in the Old Testament or whether they're called the church in the New Testament. 
that we may proclaim the, you know, we're his ambassadors. He saved us to do that, to, to be his witnesses and to proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Not only here on Sunday morning, but out there where there's more people that need to hear that. But, but think about this. He, he talks about God's people being a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, his own special people. In Exodus 19, he calls his people his treasured possession. God's people are not God's treasured possession for our own sake. What do I mean by that? We are not to boast about how special and great and wonderful we are in the sight of God, that somehow we're better than everybody else, that there's just something about us that God saw that he liked, and so he chose us as his people. That's totally not it. That is not why. Because <laughs> there's so many different ways I could go here. You know, the, the question is not, why isn't everybody his treasured possession? Why isn't everybody saved? The question is, why does God save anyone at all? Because we don't deserve it. We don't earn it. We can't. We all deserve God's wrath, the Bible says, because of our sin and rebellion. It's simply the grace of God that any of us are saved. And those of us who have been saved have a new calling and a new purpose and that's another one of those things that God has saved us to, and that is loving God and loving others. That's what he tells us in the words of Jesus in the New Testament, that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And so the Bible's clear on this. In fact, we love God, the Bible says, because he first loved us. We would not have loved him if not for him reaching down to us with his love, mercy, and grace. In fact, back to the Old Testament, look at what Deuteronomy 7 says about God's choice of Israel. It says here, for you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself for him, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all peoples, but because the Lord loves you and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Therefore know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. And he repays those who hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack with him who hates him. He will repay him to his face. Therefore, you shall keep the commandments, the statutes and the judgments, which I command you today to observe them. And you don't hear that much today. People think, ah, that's God, ah, that's the Old Testament. That's how people used to think about God and stuff. No, God, the Bible says, is the same all the time. He doesn't change. But listen, anyone who is saved is saved because of God's love, because of his name's sake, and to the praise of his glory, not ours. It's about him and not about us. Our business is ultimately to be his business and not ours. We must humble ourselves and represent him and his kingdom, his plan and his purposes. So yes, we're saved for service. Salvation did not put us into a rest home 
but on a battlefield. We are at odds with the world, not because we like it or because we want to be, but because the world is at odds with God. It has enmity with God. It's at war with God. The world hates God, and it hates everyone who truly aligns with God and his word and his work. That's what Jesus said. Don't be surprised if the world hates you because it hated me first. And also, and I touched on this earlier, did you know that because God is God, he can do whatever he wants with his creation? He is sovereign. He rules. He reigns. He's always right, and he can do no wrong. In fact, he owns everyone and everything. And he will always do what's right. Does that mean I always have to understand it? No, because I don't. There's a whole lot I don't understand. I'm just saying. But what I do want you to understand, and I'm going to go back to here. He says, for all the earth is mine. God's claim is that he's God and he owns it all, all the earth. Every one and everything belongs to God. Amen. Now, I want to clarify what I mean by that because I don't want to be misunderstood. I do not mean that everyone will be saved or that everyone is a Christian. We are all God's children creationally because he made us. We are his children creationally. Since this is our father's world, everyone and everything in it belongs to him. So we're all God's children creationally. He owns everything, everyone. But here's where I want to clarify. We are not all God's children relationally. We are not all God's children relationally. God has clearly spoken in his word, the Bible, about who belongs to him. John 1.12 says that all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So belief is a requirement. Trust in the Lord is a requirement. John 3.16 says that whosoever believeth in Jesus will not perish, but will have everlasting life. So it's not just every person without exception, it's those who believe and trust in Jesus Christ. Um, there's a verse in Romans that it says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There's a limitation there. You have to believe. Um, John, in his epistle, 1 John, says, the man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus walked. So these are all teachings about following and living for Jesus. Those who are God's children relationally follow the example and the teaching of the scriptures where Jesus says this. Look what he said in 1 Peter 4, 1 through 5. He said, therefore... Since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For we've spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walk in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. 
That's just the world we live in. They think we're the weirdos. Uh, I think we should reverse that. <laughs> um, so, just to wrap up, God initiates this covenant with Israel at Mount Sinai. And if Israel will accept and keep their end of the covenant, this will allow them to fulfill the covenant that God made with Abraham back in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. This is where the Bible said, says this. Now the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. It's so interesting that when God initiates and saves a people, the reason he does that is so that his people cannot say, God likes us more than everybody. No, it's because God wants to use those people to bless the world with his love and tell more people that God loves them and they, they can be saved too if they will just trust and believe in him. God's people, and in this case, Israel in particular, would become God's missionary people to the nations. If their lives and lips would be faithful and obedient to the Lord's calling and covenant, God would use them to reach the nations so that they too, the nations, could be adopted into God's family. So, as we wrap up, uh, the last part I want to read comes from verses 7 and 8 of Exodus 19. I didn't put it on the screen, so you might have to use your Bible. Um, it says, So Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before them all the words that the Lord commanded him. So Moses comes down from the mountain and he tells everybody, this is what God said. If you will do this, you know, I've done this for you. Now, if you will do this, you will be my people, you know, what we just read. And then verse eight, then all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. So Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. So they say, okay, God, we'll do that. We're gonna sign on and we're gonna do what you just said. And so Lord willing, Next week, we're going to pick up in verse 9, and we're going to finish up chapter 19. And then from there on, we're going to get into chapter 20, which is the Ten Commandments. And so um, I hope that you found that helpful and a blessing to you. Let's pray. Our Father God, we bow before you, and we thank you for your word. Lord, help us to live like your people need to be living so that we can uh, be useful to you as your ambassadors and your witnesses to love you and love others, that we could be a blessing to the nations. And Father, thank you for calling Israel. Thank you for calling throughout history uh, people to yourself to be saved, to make your name great. And Lord, today help us as your people, the church, to live obedient lives that share the gospel with others. God, we just thank you for all you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.